Welcome to the Civil War Digital Digest. I'm your host, Felicia, and I'm back with Mike Washner today. Felicia. And we're looking at military applications of rubber during the Civil War. And we have a lot of really great examples here today of that. Um, how did we really get to all of these great things we see in front of us? Basically, it started long before the Civil War, the ideas anyway. As okay. early as 1833 and 1834, while rubber still was not be able to use practically because of the lack of vulcanization. Uh, we were looking at suggestions by military people to use it for gun covers, cartridge boxes, and things like that, because it was a natural waterproof type material. Okay? Yeah. Uh, as we went through the 1830s then, we saw some suggestions even to use them as a rubber blanket or rubber ground cloth, which the military basically totally overlooked at that point in time. Okay. Uh, the first real uh, extensive use by the military was probably uh, pontoon boats, air-filled uh, air pontoon boats, oh. which were really a significant improvement over the old-type pontoons. They less less wagons to transport. They inflated them as they needed them, um, and uh, so as a result of that, they were used uh, fairly extensively in the Mexican War uh, okay. period. And also, I think during the Mexican War period, we have record of a number of different uh, accoutrements knapsacks, haversacks, canteens, and things that were being used during the Mexican War. So, so that's kind of the time of innovation that's leading to really the success for the Civil War. It is, and it, and it didn't prove very successful in the Mexican War. The, okay. uh, the, the, the troops didn't uh, weren't very accepting of them. Rubber was still being kind of uh, um, uh, experimented out. with, <laughs> figured out how to, how to make these different things out of, so some of them didn't work out very well. And, as a matter of fact, they went on to do experiments with a number of those types of accoutrements in the 1850s, and okay. uh, they uh, turned out so poorly that I think the quartermaster uh, crossman at that time uh, said that all the rubber goods should be thrown away except for the remaining good canteens. Okay, okay. so obviously they don't do that, and someone keeps improving on they the do. idea. They did. Um, they did. So how do we get to really having all of this? Well. Uh, Charles Goodyear had issued licenses for the use of vulcanized rubber to, um, for different applications, and one of the major companies was the Union India Rubber Company, and they were actually licensed to, to produce many different articles, but the, the key one for the Civil War is they were the only manufacturer that was licensed to manufacture uh, military goods. Really? So these guys goods. are it? They, they were it under license. Now we had a lot of pirates that were manufacturing illegally outside okay. of the license, but Union India Rubber Company manufactured um, most of the legal, all of the legal manufactured. Right. And are they manufacturing it all themselves or are they contracting it out? How's it really working? That's a good question because it, it, as the war progressed, the need for or the request for rubber blankets became so uh, extensive that they couldn't fill them all themselves. Nothing was approved by the United States military okay. uh, uh, made out of rubber until the rubber blanket. Okay. That was approved in November of 1861. Okay. They went on, by the way, to, to, to buy over 2.8 million rubber blankets wow. and ponchos during the war. But the Union India Rubber couldn't keep up with the demand. They had created a subsidiary called Phoenix Rubber Company, so there's some surviving examples that are marked Phoenix Rubber okay. and also the Goodyear patent markings. Yeah. Uh, this rubber blanket is kind of a, a cool surviving example because it's in very good shape. It has the markings of the Union India Rubber Company. It has the Goodyear patent markings on it okay. and also the inspector's marking. Oh, uh, wow. This was worn by Corporal James T. Cowan uh, from the, I believe, the 34th Massachusetts. He was wounded at 3rd Winchester. Oh. And the blanket was rolled up on his back, typical style. And yeah. uh, he was wounded at 3rd Winchester in the shoulder, and um, it went through the rubber blanket. And if you look, oh, it, yeah. it, uh, you can the bullet holes appear symmetrically in eight places wow. in that rubber blanket. So, so this really kind of cool. tells a cool story. It does. The whole story behind it is kind of neat. There's a, a little button on there that looks like a a button. It's a that's a uh, patent spring eyelet hook. It was patented in 1862, and that was made for to be able to convert a standard rubber blanket into uh, into a poncho just by okay. putting it around your shoulder and hooking it, or hooking multiple rubber blankets together for a tent. 
So we have some other stuff um, made mm -hmm. out of rubber besides the blanket that soldiers are using. And what do we have over here? Yeah, and important to point out, these were not accepted by the uh, United States government. The, the okay. rubber blanket and the cavalry tama were the only two rubber goods that were approved by the, But a lot of them were bought by state units, militia units, or okay. private, privately purchased. So we have a knapsack here that's marked, I believe, 26th Massachusetts. Okay. And that's rubber-coated cloth. Uh, we have a haversack uh, that has uh, no markings. Uh, there's a soldier's name inside, but I haven't okay. been able to make that out at this point yeah. in time. The rubber canteen has an interesting story. Probably one of the leftovers, could be one of the leftovers from the 1850s, and also could be privately purchased because they were still selling them okay. at the time. But uh, interesting tag that came with that when I bought that canteen over 25 years ago. It says, this rubber water bag was taken from a quiet rebel in Virginia. Oh, wow. Yeah, that indicates a... taken from a dead. So it's kind of, while it's a cool tag, it, um, it's also a little sad. And it, uh, as somebody said, it tells a story of somebody's son, uh, brother, or father yeah. that didn't come home, you know. So that kind of goes over some of our uh, soft rubber objects we're right. seeing in front of us. But what's going on with that bucket? What's going on with that? Yeah, this is kind of neat because a typical, like we, we see on artillery shells sometimes, it looks yeah. like the farmer, whoever found this, says this was found uh, on the Bull Run Battlefield July of uh, 1864. The, the more interesting thing to me as a collector of this stuff here are the patent markings on the bottom of that. Okay. The patent markings are uh, from Daniel Hayward's patent of 1854 for recycled or reprocessed rubber. So, Okay, so. and you had showed me a picture where a bucket very similar to this there shows is, up with some soldiers that are a seated. There's a Library of Congress photo that has a, a, it's a pretty famous one of yeah. the soldiers, and it sure looks to me when you look at the whole design of this and the way that the uh, the handle is that uh, it, it certainly looks like the same bucket as that, similar bucket. Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. Um, so we also have some hard rubber objects. Right. Um, can you tell me kind of what we're looking at here? Sure, sure. Privately purchased, of course. They weren't uh, not issued. For the, not issued for the, by the government these anyway. So we have a, uh, a U.S. Navy soap box that says don't give up the ship okay. on it. Uh, the original naval soap is still in it. It says naval soap. Oh, on wow. It. And uh, beside it is the uh, kind of the Army counterpart that has the uh, military eagle, and okay. he's holding a, uh, a razor in one of his talons, and the other talon has a banner that says morning exercise. So oh. Oh, wow. That's kind of cool. That's pretty neat. Yeah. And that beside it is a, uh, a typical India rubber comb company, cootie comb or lice comb. Okay. Uh, teeth missing as, as normal. But there's, there's some engraved initials in it. And also, in addition to the patent markings and manufacturer, the other side has an, an embossed USN, a U.S. Navy, rather, uh, okay. on the comb. So. so is that something they're being issued, or is that a private I purchase? I believe it's privately purchased. I haven't seen any contracts for, uh, for anything like that okay. for the Navy. Yeah. Well, you've brought so many interesting things for us to look at that we didn't have enough space on the table, so we're back. Um, we've reset the table and kind of are going to look at innovative things going on in the military with rubber. So I kind of want to start off with the foot in the room. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good place to start. Ar artificial limbs, as you can imagine, during the war years, the number of patents issued for artificial limbs went up significantly as the war increased. So like in 1861 and 1862, there was only one patent issued okay. each year for artificial limbs. In 1865, there was 24 patents issued for artificial limbs. One of the patentees, Amasa Marx, uh, who went on to patent many artificial limbs for the rest of the century, he patented this uh, process of manufacturing artificial uh, limbs out of uh, feet or hands or whatever out of a uh, combination of hard rubber and rubber. He was using hard rubber uh, in the base, but he was using sponge rubber on the outside to give it the feel of real human flesh. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, kind of cool. Um, you know, on that medical line also, you have uh, um, the use of... Um, uh, of rubber to unite separated intestines in some surgeries oh, into wow. rubber. And uh, also in uh, something as simple as ambulance springs where they were suspending the stretchers with India rubber rings to ease the, uh, the, the cushion kind of the, the ride along the way. So, Oh, by the way, they, uh, I should mention we talked about waterbeds in one of the previous uh, episodes and uh, 
the medical department of the Union Army purchased 1144 India rubber water beds to use for patients with bed sores. So, uh, oh, they were well, that's something that affects even the medical field today. So yes, lots of indeed. kind of modern applications with it too. Yep. So we see this application for the medical field and kind of all the advancements being made there, and we turn our attention to the soft rubber object and what is it? <laughs> it's, it's almost anything the soldier wanted it to be, okay? Okay. And they were, uh, this is a patent model, by the way, which is a, a miniature version of the intended uh, product that was to be manufactured. Okay. The patent office required that to be made up until around 1900. Yeah. So it had to be kind of a working model, yeah. exactly like you were going to, you were proposed to be produced. But uh, this particular uh, model um, is a combination tent, a uh, knapsack, a rubber blanket, poncho, air mattress, pillow, hood, everything combined, everything you would want to use. And for through, through different types of arrangements with, the, as you can see, the miniaturized buttons on it, yeah. you could make all these different things work for you. The problem with these things were, they, th they sounded like a great idea because the soldier could have all this, but they weighed way, way, way too much for okay. anybody to carry. You, you, you know, even early on, a lot of the soldiers discarded their knapsacks and were just using the rubber blanket to, uh, yeah. it was just, made a lot more sense. Well, and I know just from uh, looking at kind of the rubber blanket and stuff, I mean, they were able to use that in a myriad of ways. And so really, they're doing with just the blanket what a what, lot of people are doing with the right, combination. Right. It sounded like a good idea, it just didn't turn out to be a good idea. Now, okay. a lot of these patent models, we, we have to know too, there was a lot of things that were patented that were never produced. Okay. Just because they're just like today, if you get a patent today, you might have a patent, but you have to get some capital or some company to say, I'm going to make this for you and yeah. you have to be a market for it. Well, and you had talked about, you know, the Union Army really only approving of the gum blanket and exactly. whatnot. And so, this, you know, they're not funding it, this. No, they're <laughs> not. They're not. Okay. So now that we've covered this, um, kind of move on. I see you have a well, it looks like a rubber cartridge. What is that too? <coughs> it's kind of a transition, I think, from the paper and linen cartridges to the metallic cartridges. Okay. This was specifically, it was a, uh, this is not a patent model. This is the cartridge in mini that went with the Smith carbine. It was patented by Gilbert Smith specifically for use in that carbine. And, and it is rubber, so it was waterproof and functioned just like a metallic cartridge, but it was rubber. They, they were kind of unserviceable after they were used, but there was a patent uh, a few years after that, by, I believe a man named English, who patented a, some type of a brass fitting for the bottom of that that could make it reusable. Oh. Well, so. so I see we have kind of a variety of buttons, and I know we touched on that. Um, what are the buttons doing here for the military? Okay, yeah, the, the hard rubber buttons for the military were, were kind of specific. So uh, the one on the end, um, for instance, is a U.S. Navy hard rubber button okay. made under a Goodyear's patent, a uh, hard rubber patent, and so marked. Important to the Navy because unlike metal buttons, it wouldn't corrode from the uh, corrosive sea salt exposure. Oh. And that is, by the way, the same type of button that was found from the commander of the um, recently recovered um, CSS Hunley submarine that was oh. brought up. He had okay. been a Union Navy officer. They were his buttons. And oh, wow. the same type that was found. Uh, beside it is a uh, pretty rare Confederate Navy button. It has a cross cannons and the CN on it. It's marked on the back Manton's patent, which is not mm. exactly a hard rubber. It's a type of uh, composition okay. material, but very, very similar to similar to hard rubber in appearance. Okay, but different but from different. hard rubber. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in the center we have um, two varieties of the Berdan sharpshooter type officer's button. It okay. has the I, infantry I in the middle. The w one type is a, an earlier version, which I saw on the prototype of the Berdan, Berdan's sharpshooter uniform that's in the Smithsonian. Okay. It's, uh, it's different because the buttons are very crude. They seem to have been an early attempt. They were made by the Novelty Rubber Company under Goodyear's patent, but they're very uneven and um, um, just misshapen, if you will. Yeah. Whereas the later manufacture, uh, uh, a hard rubber button by Novelty Rubber, are, are pretty regular, pretty, okay. pr pretty normal. Why are the sharpshooters opting for this instead of just a normal military wow, button? Wow, yeah, good. I tell you, a step toward camouflage, if you will, because okay. uh, uh, the, the one thing that could give away a sharpshooter's position in a tree or whatever would be brass buttons that glistened in the sun. Okay, so, so this is Berdan, protecting. Yeah, when, 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 Berdan, when he uh, put his uh, specs in for 
the uh, uniform, he specified green coats, and he specified um, that type of button to be used so that it wouldn't shine in the sun and oh. give away the position. Well, that's pretty innovative and forward thinking. Yeah. Um, I see you have some other objects here, and I kind of want to ask, um, what are the soldiers doing with their hard rubber that they have besides using it how it is? Buttons and whatever, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, they, they found that, especially soldiers that were in, in things like winter camp or in prisons, they had a lot of time on their hands. So hard rubber became a very popular item to carve into different things. Different. Okay. Uh, a lot of uh, jewelry items have been carved out of hard rubber. They've uh, recovered a lot in sites like Johnson's Island and okay. other prison sites. Um, uh, we see here a couple examples of that. There's, kind of, uh, there's a book that's kind of like a uh, necklace or uh, what have you with a ring on it for hanging. Uh, we have a little padlock that's been carved. And uh, most frequently, I think we find a, a lot of rings and, okay. and jewelry items of that type. Uh, that particular ring there, which has sterling silver inlays, was carved by a Arkansas cavalryman who was imprisoned at Rock Island okay. Prison. So they're yeah. making this out of um, things like buttons or things other like hard, buttons. hard rubber yeah, stuff. Yeah, we they talked have. about other things like the the, the chart rules. Uh, yeah. and we were cutting those up and doing inlays of mother and pearl and even okay. silver and gold in some cases. Okay. This was coin silver that they were hammering out, and they had jewelers that were in prison that were making the little designs for the inside. And they were using uh, uh, little pins to inset them into the hard rubber. So we've seen a lot of innovation in this part of right. the episode with, you know, things with patent models, things that the Army is doing and the Navy, and finally things that soldiers are doing on their own. Right. So um, thank you for coming and bringing all of this to share with us You're today. Welcome. And Good to be here. Thank you for watching. Make sure you click the subscribe button to make sure that you will see future episodes, and we'll see you in two weeks.